That's our intro song, so I really should be on skates right now. I'm pretty fired up to, to speak to you guys today and um, really honored and humbled to be amongst so many smart, creative, and innovative thinkers in this room. So uh, thank you for having me, for sure. Before I begin, you know, what's interesting is, is the idea of putting an ice hockey team right in the middle of the desert. And that's what we've done here, and, and we're pretty proud of the work that we've done, but really, it's all about the community. For those of you guys who have been to Vegas, you've seen this community in Las Vegas has embraced this team like none other I've ever seen before. A couple things I'm just going to highlight today just uh, so you see here. Why Vegas? There's a reason why the big four major professional sports leagues decided to stay away from what they called Sin City, whether it was gambling or the persona of Vegas, but there's a reason for that. So why does it work now? Launching a brand from scratch takes a lot of people, a lot of effort. So we're going to talk a little bit about that and what it took take to build our franchise from scratch. And then community above all. Like I referenced in the beginning, community is the key to help us have the success that we've had. And that's been the number one focus of ours from the beginning. And at the end of the day, it's to be different. So our DNA is really how do we challenge the status quo? How do we look at what teams have done? how they're successful, but how do we make it a little bit different? How do we put the Vegas spin on things? So we, before we go into it, I want to show you, if you haven't been to a game yet, but if you've seen, you've heard, maybe you've seen some clips, I'm going to show you a little bit about what a game in Las Vegas is all about. Uh, in the meantime, the big news coming out of yesterday, the NHL's worst kept secret, Las Vegas now turns 30 teams into 31 in the NHL. Is it possible uh, that people who grow up playing in the sand... I mean, people don't care in general about ice hockey. It's Las Vegas doesn't make sense. We have no other pro sports teams, right? Why for hockey? A reason. Garbage name and logo. Just like the garbage idea to put a team in the desert. I don't know how in that market that you can ever make it work. That gives you a little bit of a taste of what it's like on game day for us. And, uh, you know, a lot of people ask, why Vegas? Vegas is so unique that it's really like two markets in one. You know, you think about the dynamics of Vegas when you look at it as a marketer. It's the 39th largest media market in the country. There's 2.2 million locals that live there. So it's really a small town from that perspective. But then there's 43 million tourists that come to Vegas every year as the international destination. One man had the vision, though, that it would work, and his name is Bill Foley. He's our owner. He's our chairman, and he also is the, uh, is the owner. Of, he started Fidelity Financial Services. He also owns 19 wineries and a bunch of different resort properties, and so Bill fronted the $500 million expansion fee to get the team in Las Vegas, and Bill's been known to have that golden touch in all of his investments. Seattle just applied for their franchise fee, and their fee was $650 million in a little over one year. So he's already seen his asset appreciate like that. But Bill had the foresight, and he worked with Gary Bettman, the NHL commissioner, and he said, I want to put a team in Vegas. And he was right. 
He knew before anybody else, and he knew that he could make it work. He had the vision uh, and really set that vision for us and set the goal to really make it work. But it was a quick timeline. As you can see here, we won't get into all this, but basically it was a short window to get this off the ground. February of 2015 is when the season ticket deposit campaign started. And it was 14,000 fans put down a deposit, which we converted to 12,000 full season tickets in a couple months. But they had no idea about the arena wasn't even done. They didn't know about what team. They didn't know anything. But they put the deposit down because they wanted to make it work. Then T-Mobile Arena was built, uh, $375 million joint venture arena. It's now the highest grossing arena in the world. That was April of 2015. Bill was awarded the franchise in June of 16. We finally got a name and a logo November of 16. And then we signed a few deals, like a sponsorship deal, our TV rights holder, our radio deal. And then we finally got players in June of 17. So for us, we really had to launch our brand first on social platforms without having any assets. We had no players for like a seven month period. So we got a little aggressive in our social tone. And those of you who follow us, uh, you know that. And if you don't, please follow us. We like to get a little funny now and then. And we have a little aggressive nature to our, our social platforms as well. Then we finally got players. And the fun thing about our team is they were all cast offs from another organization. So other teams didn't protect these players. And then we got everybody's leftovers. So we finally got our players. Then our practice facility, City National Arena, was built in September. And then October of 2017, our first game. Like with any good brand, when you launch, you have to develop the color palette. And I think this is key. Bill is a distinguished graduate of West Point. And so he wanted the colors to resemble uh, the US Military Academy and West Point and the colors there. But he had a little spin to it. He wanted the dark gray to resemble uh, the armor in battle. He wanted the gold to represent the opulence and the opportunity of Vegas and a tribute to the gold mining industry. And he wanted red to be the accent color because of the beautiful Red Rock Mountains that surround Las Vegas and it can act as an energizer color. But Bill worked with the NHL and Adidas and wanted to take it one step further. He said, we have to be luxurious. There has to be an element of luxury within our brand. And as you can see, this is our away and our home jerseys. White is away, home is the gray. And it's a very clean color palette, clean logos. If you look at the primary logo, it's got a beautiful, uh, the reverse space, the negative space there with a V. It's very symmetrical. So some of the other franchises I've been a part of, it's really hard, the Rams in particular, to match up that logo in different applications. Everybody wants to flip it if it's going one way or another. This is a very clean logo. On the white jerseys, we're the first team to wear white gloves. So that was key. And if you listen throughout the, the presentation, we try to be the first in a lot of different areas. But Bill wanted it when somebody turned on one of our games that you know without a doubt that that's the Vegas Golden Knights. So it stands out amongst any other team in the NHL. Bill also said he believes that the Knight is the epitome of the warrior class. We protect the unprotected. He always says, always advance, never retreat. Never give up, never give in. So that's kind of what he said since day one that we all try to operate under. So we took that one step further and we created a who we are document. You know, everybody's got this in every organization. A lot of times it just sits on the wall and you don't really live it out. But we wanted to really live it out on a daily basis. And when you start from scratch, you can really encourage that. So our mission is simple, taking right from Bill's words, always advance. Whether that's one more call, one more sale, whether it's, whether it's one more shift, always advance on the hockey side and the business side. And then our vision as knights were the epitome of the warrior class, we will be champions on the ice and in the community. But then we developed these brand traits, which act as decision-making filters. So in, in just, instead of just being fun words, we actually put these into process. They're bold, humble, innovative, inspiring, strong, worldwide, and valiant. And all of our team uses these as a filter when they make their decisions, whether it's looking at a prospective partner uh, that wants to spend money with us. We use them as, as a decision-making tree. And so those are key for us. 
And since you start an organization from scratch, you get a chance to really hire the best people and to do it the right way. So when we started off hiring on the business side and on the hockey side, we put that no ego approach, real true emphasis on the character of people that we were bringing to Las Vegas. Most of the employees actually relocated and they came to Vegas for the first time. We only have 88 full-time staff members on the business side, which is really small compared to other sports teams. So we scale ap appropriately. That's key for us, because we still refer to ourselves as a startup. But what we're able to do is we're able to recruit the best of the best, and we're able to onboard them like nobody else can. So on the player side, here's a couple examples that we can only do in Vegas, but it's still fun. When we acquired Max Pacioretty from Montreal, and then we acquired Mark Stone from Ottawa, the first thing we did is we greeted him at the airport with all of our castmates, with our Golden Knight, with our, uh, our Gila monster, which is our soft, cuddly mascot. His name is Chance. And we have our Vegas Bells. We have our, all of our promo teams were there to greet him. But we took it one step further. We contacted all the casinos on the Strip and put our artwork so that their faces were all up and down the Strip. Then we took it one more step further, and we got him up in a helicopter and had him fly down the Strip so they could see and officially welcome them to Vegas. So that's taking it one step further. But for us, it's a great recruiting tool because the first thing they're going to do is take pictures and talk about how we, we onboarded them the right way. Community is key. So for us, we had to identify right away what our pillars were from a community relations standpoint and what we wanted to stand behind. So for us, it's a few different things. It's youth and education. It's health and wellness. It's hunger and homelessness. And it's military. And those are the key factors for us in terms of how we outreach to the community. You know, we like to say yes to everything, but you really need to be strategic with what you really focus your attention and a lot of your funding on. And so those are our key uh, community partners. And then you have to launch a campaign. So for us, we didn't want to just launch a disposable tagline that sports teams usually refresh every year. We wanted something that meant something to the people of Las Vegas. We're the first major professional sports franchise that's truly Vegas born. And so people got excited about that. It started to click emotionally, whether they were from Vegas or not. They eventually had kids that, that were born in Vegas. And here's a couple of activation examples that we use Vegas born. But when it really started to click was when people used it beyond just the hashtag. And I got to see little kids going to games, like that kid up there holding a poster that he made himself that says Vegas born. And kids all around Las Vegas said, I'm Vegas born too, just like the Golden Knights. And we've got 50,000 license plates in the, in the market now that fans have put on the back of their cars. We crashed a puck through the Caesars Tower. We've got 30,000 library cards with Vegas born. And then my favorite program of all is when a baby is born at one of our Summerlin hospitals, the first article of clothing that they get is a Vegas born onesie, so they become fans for life. And true transparency, that's, uh, I had to live out the campaign. So that's my baby right there, little Knox. Lucky baby, seven pounds, seven ounces there. So I got to live it as well. But for us, it's important to be Vegas born and to really live that out. So we created a TV spot. This is one that actually hasn't hit the market yet, but it's something we've been working on because of the fandom of hockey here in the, de in the desert in Vegas. It's amazing. There's so many kids that are playing hockey now. And we said it's our goal that one day to have a kid that goes through our hockey programming that goes on to play for the Golden Knights. So we kind of reverse engineered that for our latest TV spot. I want to show it to you guys right here. The Vegas Golden Knights are proud to select from UNLV, Bobby James. Bobby, get in there. So for us, our, our TV spots, just an overall marketing mix, not to get too deep, but our TV spots were able to be a little bit more brand heavy uh, based upon the success of our ticket sales. So it allows us the opportunity to kind of lead with the brand and then be retail specifically on digital channels when we need to push uh, remaining tickets to certain games. 
This is really important. This is something I've tried to subscribe to throughout my career, and we really try to live it out in Vegas, is to hook kids when they're young. If you guys think about when you became a fan of a particular sport, you know, whether it was family, whether it was generational, whether you liked the colors, whether it was passed down by friends, whether it was where you lived, you usually become a fan of a particular team before the age of eight. You think about your own upbringing. So for us, if we can, if we can hook a kid by the age of eight, we feel like we've developed lifelong fans. There was a great article published in the New York Times that references that, but it actually goes into the psychology of becoming a fan at an early age. So a lot of what we do is to really try to get kids to experience in one way or another, whether it's at a game, or whether it's at one of our practices where they get an autograph for free, or whether it's a school program, even a mascot visit. We like to have that personal touch with our brand at an early age, and that makes a difference for us. But the number one way to develop fandom is to actually get a stick in the hands of kids. And so that's been a priority since day one. And we're really proud of a program that we launched with the Clark County School District where we're able to reach 200,000 kids by teaching the PE teachers how to play hockey, and then they pass it along to the kids at the elementary schools in, uh, in the Clark County School District. We have 5,000 kids that are now learning to skate because they have to learn to skate and feel comfortable skating before they play on the ice. Uh, so that's another program that we're really excited about. And then we've got lear women's learn to play programs. We've got street hockey clinics. So for us, we do a lot of outreach in the community. If we can leave behind a stick for a kid, we feel pretty comfortable that we can establish fans for life. We took it one step further, and we're really excited about this. We're a year, basically a year before the Raiders get here is when we launch this. Raiders are going to play in Las Vegas. It's going to elevate the city's profile tremendously as the new sports and entertainment capital of the world, not just the entertainment capital of the world. But we thought it'd be cool to really go deeper within this youth outreach. You know, a lot of, a lot of people say, especially parents, they try to get their kids specialized into one sport over another at an early age. Well, we know there's tons of kids that love the Golden Knights in Vegas, and we also know they play other sports. So we want to encourage them to play other sports because it ultimately makes them a better hockey player. So we've actually done partnerships with youth hockey, girls and boys youth basketball, girls and boys youth soccer, and then flag football and tackle football and youth baseball. And we've actually gone deeper from that perspective. We're really proud of that. Uh, there was a fun story that uh, a Raiders executive I was having lunch with said his kid is in this league. And he came home uh, from one of the practices and he was upset because he got his uniform and he was on the Raiders and he wasn't on the Golden Knights. So that was pretty funny. But for us, it allows that brand extension in areas you wouldn't normally think. One of the areas we're really, uh, we're really proud of and we get a lot of accolades about is our game entertainment. And for us, we had to set the standard from that perspective. We're in Vegas. We're not just competing with the other NHL teams. We're competing with the Strip and all the entertainment options there. So we said a goal was to be the hottest show on the Strip. So when people always ask that when they come to Vegas, what's the hottest show on the Strip? Well, now we want it to be the Golden Knights game. But it's the only place in the world I think you can get away with some of these things. We've got intermissions where we've got Cirque du Soleil and Blue Man Group. We've got a live sword in the stone moment that you can see there that's, that's mixed with digital mapping on our ice. Uh, we've got incredible moments uh, that we have all throughout our games. So we always try to surprise and delight. And we try to put on a show so that when fans walk away, whether we win or lose, they had an experience. One of the things we had to do was also build a lifestyle brand. You know, we had a ton of jersey sales in year one, year two as well, but people wanted more. So we had to keep up with the demand. So we've become somewhat of a licensing company. If you look here, uh, I don't know if anybody saw the Tyson Fury press conference that just happened, uh, but I was getting uh, some, some texts on that. He wore our, our white starter jacket at his press conference for his fight uh, that's coming up this weekend. So we try to pepper that out as much as possible. But we've got $500 robes. We've got bourbon. We've done VGK wine. We've got adult onesies. We've got suit jackets. For us, we've got uh, cigars we did. We had bikes this Christmas. Fans just can't get enough. And so we have to constantly keep trying to reinvent new opportunities for them to showcase the brand. And then our digital and social media strategy, that's a real key for us. Again, we had seven month window where we weren't able to promote any players. 
So we established a tone on social. But we also try to be first movers where we can, like on Twitch and TikTok, we're the first NHL team to be on those platforms. But we can't just be on it and then sit back. We have to be active on these platforms as well. And then we've got an incredibly diverse fan base. So for us, it was important to have Spanish language outlets for Twitter and Instagram, and also Weibo and WeChat uh, in Mandarin as well. And then we noticed this incredible phenomenon in year one, where fans in over 100 different countries purchased Golden Knights gear. But we sat back and said, from a business perspective, we're not getting any of the revenue and not getting any of the data. It's awesome, but we're not receiving any of that. So why don't we launch our own worldwide platform, which we did. And it's a really cool way, if you go to vgkworldwide.com, and you're anywhere in the world, you can drop your pen, and you can become part of a unique, exclusive fan club uh, where it really tries to connect people around the globe. And then Vegas. There's celebrities and residencies all the time. So part of our strategy is to really get these influencers to our games to experience it. And so we've had a, a lot of success in bringing influencers into the, into the, the arena and, and really wearing our gear and celebrating it. We've got our jersey on Lady Liberty. Uh, you can see Lil John was in the clip, Imagine Dragons. So, but it's really unique because when I was in St. Louis, we were begging celebrities to come to the Rams games. Here, they want to come to the Golden Knights game because they see the platform of what the Golden Knights can do as well for them. And then lastly, I want to give just a few examples of that way that we think in terms of be different. And it's really key to what we do. The first example is actually our chief sales officer named Jim Frivola. And he's a, he, he's a model as well. He goes by his alter ego, Phil, for some reason. But instead of, instead of celebrating a resolution, let's do an anti-resolution package in Vegas that includes one ticket, a hot dog soda, and a five pack of VGK cigars. So that was for our game that we needed a little bit of help with, because in Vegas, you know, New Year's Day is, is, is not the easiest to get people to come out to, uh, to a game. And so we pushed that with, uh, with Jim. And then after our, our goalie, Mark andre Fleury, every game he has a shutout, we throw an inflatable donut on the ice because we built in a promotion with Krispy Kreme where if there's a shutout, then everybody in attendance at that game gets a dozen free donuts from Krispy Kreme. So he celebrates it as well. We have did some content around him driving through uh, to Krispy Kreme through the drive through and getting a dozen donuts himself. So he's a big... Big fan of that as well. Other teams have season ticket member events, and it's usually like in uh, a conference room, and uh, it's pretty sterile. But in Vegas, you have an opportunity to do a season ticket member event at the high roller at the link. So fans got a chance to be in with our players through entire 20-minute session, a real intimate opportunity as they're overlooking the strip. It's a really cool opportunity there. And then we like to think differently. So instead of just rolling out the traditional hats, we cut up a jersey, one of Marc Andre Fleury's jerseys, and we made it into three hats with New Era. And each of those sold for $2,500 a piece because we gave it the exclusive window, one of three. On the left, you see we celebrate gates open. So instead of celebrating just the win, we celebrate and throw streamers and horns and buzzers. And we have a huge moment when we open up gates which is unique. So people crowd to, to, uh, to our main entrance right at the beginning of every game because they want to be part of that moment. And then one of my favorites on the right there, we created a wall of distraction for visiting teams <laughs> with Vegas showgirls. Because if they're thinking about that moment for one second when they go back in the locker room, then we've done our job in distracting them. So that's against Calgary, actually. I think that's Kachuk. And then uh, a couple more things here. When we have a watch party, we do it different. So we were able to use the Mandalay Bay Beach, which is an incredible opportunity where they've got big pools and sand, and we try to do things different. And then year one, we actually cemented every season ticket member's name in the ice. We thought that was a cool way to really honor the people that put the commitment down for our season ticket deposit. So we put all their names in ice. Year two, we said we had to do something different. So we actually brought season ticket members down and they sprinkled 14 karat gold in our actual ice as part of our ice design. We started an inner circle. So because of our owners, Bill Foley's interests in wine and in Rock Creek Cattle Company and resorts, we created this incremental revenue stream 
where fans want to be part of this inner circle. So they can buy packages for $40,000 that includes three trips, one to uh, a destination city for an NHL game, one to wine country in Sonoma, and then one to Montana on his private jet. So they're paying for the access with Bill. And then lastly, it never hurts to present a jersey to the Pope. So we like to do that as well. And that's it. So thanks for having me, and go Knights, go. All right, Brian. Pick your chair. Pick your chair. Do you want a drink? Take a drink? Yeah, I'm good. Pause. I think you answered most of my questions, but I added another three or 400 on here, I think. So All right. we'll get into it. Uh, I think the hashtag is up there, everybody. So underscore TGS underscore uh, VGK, Vegas Golden Knights. Um, so it was really interesting sort of sitting down and just going through, like, obviously we're a country full of uh, hockey fans for the most part. I'm going to save some of that, but, um, I just want to start with my experience because I went to, I think the third, uh, third game in Vegas when you guys, uh, when you guys started and I was, uh, there with, uh, some business, uh, business friends. And I think what I had experienced, um, was something I didn't expect. And uh, the biggest part for me, being at many Leafs games and Calgary games and Edmonton games, et cetera, is there's a lot of hockey fans, there's a lot of people that are going to be entertained. But you go to Vegas, um, you know, for me it was sitting in a crowd full of strangers, but yet everybody was so interested in what was going on. So there's one example, um, you know, there was a, obviously a, a delayed penalty, they pulled the goalie and people around us were confused. They were really wondering what was going on. They're like, why is he going away from the net? They're going to score. And we're sitting there with uh, four other Canadians and um, such an intimate environment. They're asking us questions. They're like, okay, well, you guys know what's going on. Like, tell us what's happening. So my first kind of question <laughs> is what I, again, what I experienced was there was a lot of education in the game. So there's a lot of communication, a lot of talking about the rules, not just with just us and everybody around, but obviously as part of the experience. Can you tell us a little bit about the goal from a brand, from marketing and a communication perspective? Because you have a global audience that's coming and visiting, in many cases, probably their first hockey game. Right. Uh, tell us a little bit about how that came into to play and, and how that still is important with uh, the brand itself. Yeah, I mean, for us, it's interesting because a lot of people would think that we're built our business on the tourism market. And for us, it's our season ticket base is almost 90% local. And uh, what we noticed from day one, and we actually got a couple bits of advice from other teams like Arizona, we didn't want to dumb down the sport or the rules to the audience. And so from, um, from our first preseason game on, we just made the decision that we weren't going to like say, okay, what is icing and actually define it for fans. You know, there is still that uh, inquisitive nature of our fan base as they're still learning hockey. But we did notice that the predominantly, uh, the majority of our fans did understand the sport. They, they really understood the nuances of it because they knew the rhythm and when to cheer, when not to cheer. So the worst thing we could have done is to try to insult people with their hockey knowledge. So we made the decision not to do that. Uh, but for us, it's really about acknowledging the fact that I think the fan base fell in love with the Golden Knights first, and then they fell in love with hockey. And that's key because there's a, there's a difference. Yeah, is, is it something around that they truly, I mean, mentioned a population and, and obviously starting a new brand, but it's something that was brand new for them that they could really grab a hold of. And you, you touched on the brand and the experience and the kids and all those kinds of things. But, you know, it really to me was just even going in an Uber on the way, uh, was everybody talking about something that they could really own and grab onto? Is that a sense that's something that you guys did on purpose or just naturally came about? Or There's a couple things. I think uh, the Vegas market was incredibly hungry for a major professional sports team. And now it's something that they call their own. I think if you talk to people that have lived in Vegas for a number of different years, whenever they'd go out of Vegas and travel, the first question would be like, oh, do you live on the Strip? How much do you gamble? Like, so now they have an identifier in the Golden Knights, and it became this badge of honor where they would wear our, the gear anywhere they go and where they travel, and they were proud to be part of that family. Cool. So um, are you playing hockey yet? My kids are. Okay. I still can't skate. Have you watched... Uh, Young Blood, Slapshot, and the other required movie, which I can't remember at the top of my head. Miracle, right? Uh, not Slapshot 2, uh, Strange Brew, Slapshot which is ultimately two. the game. So anyway, that's a little little homework for later. But so I checked a couple of those. Okay. You're from Tampa. Yes. Tampa Bay. And obviously you spent a lot of time baseball, football, but you're from Tampa Bay. Talk to us about the big decision to go away from family, I'm assuming, and start a family in Vegas. Yeah, it's uh, it's it was a... 
a really big decision. I mean, for us, uh, my wife, who's here, um, she traveled to, to this beautiful part of the country to experience this as well. Um, you know, I've got three young boys, so it's ultimately a family decision when you, when you uh, change jobs, specifically in sports, because it's, it's really uh, cyclical in terms of how often you have the opportunity to move. But with Tampa, with the Buccaneers, I was able to go back home and work for a hometown team. But when I got the call to go to Vegas, it's a chance to start something from scratch. And very rarely do you get the opportunity to launch something from scratch and have it be truly an entrepreneurial opportunity in the entertainment capital of the world. And so uh, after some, some good conversations, we decided to take the leap. And uh, I know my wife had never been to Vegas before we moved there. So that was, uh, so it was a pleasant surprise once we got there, because it's a beautiful community uh, that most people don't see beyond the Strip. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I, I, I love Vegas. Not too far from here. So congrats on the, the recent pickup. Great defenseman. Uh, you guys are second in the Pacific. How many uh, Oilers fans here? Probably a few. One or two, okay. How many Leafs fans? Okay, we'll save that for later. How many Golden Knights fans? Yeah. Um, but you've got, that's right, how many have been to a Golden Knights game here? Be good to know. Good amount. Nice. I mean, it is an unbelievable experience. The other thing, too, is just the organization, the entertainment itself, and the community, and all the great things. But to me, the, the experience before and after getting an Uber, uh, the different parking lots, the people greeting us at the game. And I know it was, we were at one of the first intros, um, but it was such a, a, a relation to the experience of customer service. How does that come into every type of uh, entertainment piece or game or experience that you bring to the, to the brand? You know, Vegas is built on hospitality. I think that's the beauty of it. And so what I've been most impressed with is we have partnerships with seven different casino partners on the Strip. And all of them on game day put their entire staff, their frontline staff, in Golden Knights jerseys. And it's just incredible to see the way that the whole strip and the entertainment industry has embraced the team. And so from, from our perspective, we try to live up to that standard because, you know, you're expecting to come to Vegas and you're expecting the hospitality to be top notch. And so it's a big part of our training with our game day staff. Uh, we make sure all of our, we call them line mates, which is our staff members. We don't use the, the phrase departments because it's kind of off-putting. We call everybody that we work with line mates because you rely and trust on each other. So they're there, everybody's greeting everybody coming in as all the fans come in. And it's really neat to see because then you start establishing these relationships with your fans and, uh, and it's, it's beyond the hockey game. It was just so clean, and there were so many food options. I was, I was, I loved it. Okay, uh, just jumping on to What'd Twitter, I had the big turkey leg. There you go. It's very simple, gluten free, and you know, a whole bunch of problems I have. So, uh, uh, big question here. So, how much interaction between the business, the marketing, and hockey operations do you guys deal with? You know, that's been a part of a couple of different organizations I've been with, where you want to have the whether it's football or baseball or now hockey, you want to have the hockey ops side in sync with the business side. Because if you don't have that, it's really hard to do your job. And we've got the beauty of that with, uh, with what we've established from, from day one. You know, access is key with a marketer, uh, from a marketer's perspective. And so you have to have the access with the players. You have to have the trust that your hockey ops folks aren't going to get mad when we send out a threatening tweet towards, you know, Montreal or another team like that. You have to have trust that that's going to be OK. And so our access is incredible. And I know a lot of organizations struggle with that, but we truly have this no ego approach. And so there's a lot of interaction between uh, the hockey ops side and the business side. And I know how challenging it is when you don't have that. Um, and uh, it, for us, it allows us the opportunity when we know a trade's happening, uh, that we're able to get it out on our platforms first before it gets out uh, by beat writers and others. We're even able sometimes to have, like when we signed Flurry to a contract extension. He got it out himself uh, with the selfie video that we're able to publish on our channels. It makes a big difference when there's that alignment with uh, both the hockey side and the business side, and we're blessed to have that. Great. It comes back to the customer service, all three working well together. Obviously, you're going to be more successful. Um, Bryson DeChambeau said something this past weekend about golf becoming what Happy Gil Gilmore was to golf. And they said, if we don't do something about this sport, it's just going to be like Happy Gilmore. And it caused a whole bunch of conversation within the, the golf world. Um, a lot of people say that, that Vegas represents too much sometimes. I happen to completely disagree. I think it's great for the game, what you're doing to educate 
is a, a huge deal. Do you guys have that, those conversations around too much for the brand or too little? How do you push boundaries knowing that Las Vegas is always somebody in a, uh, you know, in, a, in a city that does things first? So how do you balance that? Yeah. Well, first of all, Bryson DeChambeau came to our game and did the rally siren before one of his tournaments, and he claimed he hurt his hand, but he ended up winning the golf tournament the next day. So we're good there. Luckily, we'll get him back. I mean, for us, it's... Uh, you know, it's Vegas. You, you can get away with a lot more. And I think that's the keys. You keep pushing the envelope. You keep trying new things. Um, honestly, we, we try a lot and we fail and people maybe don't see it. We launched, we, we did an organ this year, you know, traditional hockey organ. It was terrible. So we scrapped that. Our fans didn't want that. They wanted two live DJs and they wanted house music. And so that's what they've come to know. But we try a lot of different things and some things stick, some things don't. But we're not afraid to try. Which is, which is great for the game because so many times you see the same things, you hear the same things from the same audience members, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so obviously baseball, football, uh, you've been in sports marketing a long time. Talk to us about your personal journey, but in terms of how it's different in hockey, hockey marketing, if you can. Yeah, I think as a marketer, a lot of it stays the same. Um, I spent 10 years in baseball with the Tampa Bay Rays. I was a part of some awful franchises that led the league in losses for a number of years in a row, and then were able to acquire the first pick in subsequent drafts and ended up going to the World Series in 2008. But I learned how to market a bad product, I think, through those tough times because you can't rely on the players when your team is terrible. So, but you can, you can market what you can control. And so I think that's a focus of what I tried to live out in my careers, market the experience, market the families, market the memories, what you can control, and that's why I think you take it to the next level here in Vegas. Uh, after 10 years in baseball, I moved on to the NFL, and other than the seasons being completely opposite with 81 home games versus eight home games, um, a lot of the same marketing principles apply in St. Louis at the time, still trying to put butts in the seats, still trying to generate revenue. Uh, starting quarterback Sam Bradford got hurt, season-ending injuries two out of the three years I was there. So again, had good training in terms of how to market a bad product uh, in St. Louis. Then went to Tampa, struggled a couple years there. So uh, I thought it was bad luck until I came to Vegas and then we started winning. And, um, but for us, it's, it's taken a look at the different, the different seasons is really the only difference. I think what football, the challenge with the NFL is it's a built for TV product. And not only with the financials that you get with the national TV deal, but it's also a better product on TV. And you deal with the fact that if you lose a game on a Sunday, you have an entire week where there's nothing but chatter on social talk radio, TV, talking about how terrible the team is, and you can't write the ship until the next Sunday. Whereas hockey, there's a great rhythm to the season. Very rarely do you play you know, two games back to back. You know, Baseball, there could be a 13-game homestand, but at least in hockey, there's a good rhythm where if the team loses, then they're playing the next day or, the, or the, in, a, in a couple days for sure. Yeah, and I think we're at, we're out of time, but thank you again for what you've done for diversity and getting the youth involved in, in, a, in a city I know where they, they're loving hockey and getting into it. The numbers for a while were sort of dipping and now it's creeping up. So hopefully you're setting the standard for other NHL teams and, and other sports you know, across the globe. So again, round of applause for, for Brian, everybody. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it.